We know with most mental illnesses is the longer that they stay in the brain, the harder they become to treat. So if we can treat it in a few weeks rather than a few months, um, you know, we're going to get better outcomes. Hello, I'm Annie DeMelt and welcome to this Code Life interview brought to you by the Montreal General Hospital Foundation. Our guest today is Dr. Karine Nigartua, psychiatrist in chief of the MUHC's mental health mission. And that mission is to provide the best patient care through innovative programs, but also through research. Uh, researching new ways to make treatment more personalized, more precise. So, Dr. Igartua, thank you so much for being Thanks with for us. Thanks for having me. Um, let's start by how incredibly busy you are right now in the departments of psychiatry and psychology. We've gone through a difficult phase for a lot of people's uh, mental health. What are you seeing right now in terms of demand and, and access to your services? We're in a really tough situation um, because the demand is increasing or has been increasing for many, many years, um, and the resources have been shrinking. So, you know, when I started my residency, we had between the the old Royal Vic and the old Montreal General probably about 120 beds in psychiatry. We now have 42. Um, so that's sort of been gradual over time, less beds. Um, with COVID, there's been a lot of people who've decided to retire or leave the healthcare system. So in terms of personnel, we've got a difficulty too. Um, but also we have a society that is moving in ways that I, I want to say is toxic to our brain, um, whether it's the higher doses of THC in our now legal cannabis, uh, whether it's the complete bombardment of our brain of always being on our phones and on our Zooms and our Teams and our in front of a screen, mm. uh, which means that our brain never really has time to relax, cool down. Um, whether it's also the lack of sleep because people tend to have their phones in their bedrooms and, you know, they watch, they binge Netflix late at night and they don't sleep or the lack of exercise, because we know that the more time you spend in front of a screen, the less you move around, the less you move around, the less exercise you're getting. Um, and finally, the, the, the lack of community and socialization. Even when people, I, I see it, the kids, when they're together, they're all together sitting on the couch, but everybody's on their own different phone. So they're together, but not really together. So that sort of leads to isolation and lack of feeling of connectedness. So there's all of these kind of this cocktail. <laughs> this cocktail, these trends that are happening in society that are bad for our mental health. Um, and so put that together with difficulty getting first line care, difficulty accessing a GP if you actually have one, or a psychologist if you're lucky to have insurance. So people come to the emergency room because they have nowhere else to go. And some people come for, you know, bona fide mental illness. So um, psychotic disorders or mood disorders, but a lot of people also come with emotional distress, uh, social crises. Um, and the reality is this week in the emergency room, you know, I see a patient who's been there for 10 days down in our unit waiting for a bed upstairs. Um, it's not always that bad, but you know, a couple of days down and emerge waiting for a bed upstairs is absolutely not unusual because we just we don't have the capacity right so increased demand you know lower capacity or capacity that's not keeping up which is forcing you to be a lot more um, efficient with your programs and you do have a number of specialized programs that are part of the the, the mental health mission yeah one of them that we're going to talk about is this uh, transition day program um, so who's this for who what population is this is this for people in crisis or um, and, and who and how is it unique and innovative so the transitional day program it's it's funny to say that it's innovative now because we've had it for 20 years but it was the only it was innovative 20 years ago, and to my knowledge, it's still the only program in the province like this. So essentially, we took all of the therapeutic ingredients of a hospitalization. So whether it's seeing an OT to help with goal setting and organization, whether it's psychoeducation around illness and illness management, um, whether it's uh, identifying emotions and emotional regulation, um, coaching about nutrition and exercise, uh, we even have a choir that's part of that, so music therapy. Um, so all of the sort of therapeutic ingredients of a hospitalization, 
but in a day program format, sort of. So patients arrive early in the morning. They have a couple of uh, workshops during the morning. They have lunch at the hospital cafeteria, so a bit more normalizing than, you know, a tray in your room kind of thing. It creates a uh, uh, socialization and, and a sort of a group belonging kind of uh, effect. They have a few more workshops in the afternoon than they might have an individual meeting or two. Uh, and then they go home. Mm -hmm. uh, and the going home is great because it means we're, we're promoting recovery and not regression. So you go home, uh, you still get to walk your dog, you still get to check your emails, you still get to hug your sister. Um, so the going home, the messaging is you're not taking a break from your life. You are, you know, in recovery of whatever crisis you're in. Uh, and we want to get you back to your life as soon as possible. Right. Yeah. So TDP is, was innovative when we started it, and uh, we want to innovate further. So um, two of the things that we're, we're going to be, we're going to be looking at TDP in terms of adapting some of the therapies um, so that, you know, the patient with the first episode mania might not need exactly the same thing as the patient who is in a suicidal crisis, for instance. Right. So so we might be mapping out the trajectories a little bit differently. For that, we need the help of a psychologist. Um, and that's actually great because that's one of the things that the foundation is helping us with. Um, the other project that we want to bring in is Les Impatients. Les Impatients is a community organization. They're well established. Um, it's artists um, that run workshops for people with mental illness. Um, and they're also recovery oriented. Uh, so we want to bring in Les Impatients so that um, people in the transitional day program and actually people in our brief intervention unit have access to uh, this art expression. And, and you talked about sort of mapping out people's trajectory and the importance of, of planning to, given this this context. Um, you know, in, in the, for, for psychiatric emergency care, how does this brief intervention unit, uh, unit do that? What's its role as part of the bigger picture? Yeah, so one of the other things we've done to try and, and palliate the, the lack of beds, but also in terms of being more efficient in treatment, is we opened the brief intervention unit. And the brief intervention unit is for people who we think a three to five day hospitalization uh, will be beneficial. Um, so we've mapped out six or seven uh, clinical situations in which patients might present that might be useful. So whether it's a first episode psychosis, whether it's an intoxication um, that's altering mental status, or whether it's um, a Patient, patient with a personality disorder that's in crisis uh, or a patient with, in a suicidal crisis. So these are the type of trajectories of patients that might come to the BIU. Um, and what we've done is trajectory mapping so that everybody knows with this particular clientele, in the first 0 to 12 hours, this is what we do. The next 12 to 24, this is what we do. On day 2, day 3, day 4. So we, we will... Um, Everybody's on board. The nurses know. There's a psychologist sort of running the show. The doctors know. So everybody knows what their role is and what their role is on day one, two, and three so that there's less waiting around for, mm -hmm. for treatments to happen. In addition to managing this and, and so much more, uh, <laughs> you're one of the uh, co-founders of the McGill Sexual Identity Center. So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about what kind of specialized care you're providing to, uh, to patients there right now. Yeah, so we're the first and as far as I know, still the only psychiatric clinic that caters to sexual minorities. Initially, the clinic was um, meant to be a safe space for lesbian, gays, bisexuals, particularly because psychiatry had stigmatized them for many, many years. Okay. It was a pathology in, in our DSM. Um, over time, society has evolved, people have evolved. Uh, so internalized homophobia and just straight discrimination for homosexuality is much less. So we see much less of that population. However, that's kind of been in parallel with this explosion of people questioning their gender identity. Um, and so I would say our 
population that we cater to now is about 75 or 80 percent people questioning their gender their gender identity the range is is obviously greater than what we would have had a few years ago yeah. uh, acceptability you talked about acceptability being greater so what are you working towards in, in your treatment and what you offer those patients so it used to be that when we talked about the trans population, we're talking about a very specific minority of people who were hell-bent on changing the body and the gender that they had been assigned at birth. Um, and so these were people who were willing to go to terrible lengths because, our, I have to say it, our treatments were archaic. We asked people to, to cross-dress for a year before giving them access to hormones, which is really just asking for discrimination it's really right. it's really quite sad but so so the that population that that trans population we actually have good data on sort of the lack of regret or the 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 happiness with their outcome so these were people that were uber motivated to transition from one box to the other now what we're seeing is an explosion of boxes not everybody feels that masculine and feminine cater to everything and that some people feel in between or a mixture of both or they feel more masculine on one day more feminine on the other day um, and we're getting a lot of teenagers that are questioning this um, so our understanding of gender identity has shifted over the years and society's understanding of gender identity has shifted we're more open and at the same time we're not so on the one hand we now tell people you can choose the gender that you want. You want to be masculine, you go ahead and be masculine. But there's still this sort of subconscious underlying message that you can be masculine, but you better make sure your body corresponds right. to the gender you've chosen. Um, and so what we're trying to work towards is undoing that sort of body determinism for gender and sort of saying people can adopt whatever gender they want and they can be in their body however they feel more com most comfortable and we don't have to have just these two boxes um, and so that implies that not everybody's going to have the same transition journey um, you know where it used to be first social transition then hormonal then surgical that's sort of the archaic way of doing it uh, now some people will have a social transition without anything else mm -hmm. you know uh, I'm no longer Patricia I'm Patrick Just call me Patrick I'm cutting my hair short I want to be known as Patrick some people that'll be sufficient for them. For other people, I want my voice to deepen. So I'm going to take hormones just until my voice deepens, and then that's it. I don't want the other hormonal effects. So all that to say is that there's there's a whole um, uh, eventail, there's range, a whole guess, range, yeah. thank you, of, of gender presentations. Um, and what we work towards in the clinic is helping people to figure out how to embody their gender in a way that's most comfortable for them. How important is it to to have that that pathway to be able to predict outcomes and and what's the connection with one of your flagship uh, research projects at the uh, at the MGH? You know, one of the questions we get the most often when we have teenagers coming in with their parents is how do I know that they're not going to regret this decision later? Right? And the answer is we don't know. Right. The reality is that this population is so new that we don't have data particularly on teens okay. who are first questioning their gender in their adolescence. You know, they didn't do it in childhood, so they arrive at 13, 14, 15, and all of a sudden they're questioning their gender. Um, we don't have very much data, outcome data, to know am I better off transitioning or am I going to be just as miserable but with a different body? Mm -hmm. um, so any kind of um, research that would allow us to track this population prospectively uh, and see when I transition, does that improve my mental health outcomes or not, um, would be great. And that's exactly what we can do with the Center for Precision Psychiatry, which is our big research project uh, in the department, uh, because that's what it does. It gets patients when they, when they're, when they first come into the clinic, uh, and patients can be followed for 10 years um, with you know, twice yearly psychological assessments, um, a whole bunch of baseline psychological data to try and figure out what the predictive factors are going to be, uh, but then also biomarkers and imaging. 
scanning. So uh, patients who agree to will get their brain scanned. So, so we're really looking at all different kinds of data to try and then, you know, in 10 years, we'll be able to retrospectively look back and go, oh, when patient had A, B, and C, they were more likely to be happy post-transition than not. Mm -hmm. And Uh, this is for all kinds of different conditions, so it could help you predict an episode of psychosis or, you know, someone who comes in with a depression really young. Exactly. Yeah, what are some of the other potential scenarios? So, you know, there's a lot of trial and error in, in psychiatry because, you know, we can't, when a patient comes in, you know, crack their skull, open their brain, take a slice and have a look at it to figure out what we need to give them. So there's a lot of trial and error. So whether it's about antidepressants, uh, you know, am I better off with Welbutrin or Effexor or Prestique uh, or Remeron? Um, Or, you know, for a bipolar patient, is this a bipolar patient who's going to respond to lithium or is this going to be a lithium non-responder who's, you know, would be better off with Epival, for instance? Or for the first episode psychosis, is this someone who I can get away with treating a very tiny dose of an antipsychotic? or is this someone who's going to need a bigger dose Mm -hmm. Um, and so right now we kind of do that you know with trial and error and and sort of gestalty kind of feelings about things Um, and so we have to readjust our treatments uh, which is okay we do that Um, but you know if we're able to target the exact dose somebody needs quickly then we get to remission faster Mm -hmm. Um, and we know with most mental illnesses is the longer that they stay in the brain, the harder they become to treat. So if we can treat it in a few weeks rather than a few months, um, you know, we're going to get better outcomes. As a psychiatrist psychiatrist in chief and also as a clinician, you know, what would you hope, where would you hope we would be in, you know, 10, 20, 15 years? What would you what would you, your, your dream be if you're allowed to dream big a little bit? In terms of treatment, it would be great to be able to be able to identify which treatment would be would be good for Mm-hmm. any specific person, right? Because y- you can have five or six people come in with the same constellation of I can't sleep, I'm tired all the time, I can't concentrate, uh, you know, and, and I'm ruminating. Um, somebody that's going to be a depression and they're going to respond to an antidepressant for somebody else that's going to be, uh, you know, a hyperadrenergic state that's going to respond to something else. There's, you know, all different mm-hmm. kinds of ways of looking at it. Um, but if I can dream even bigger than that, um, I would hope that we would, our society would have enough of an awareness of what our mental health needs are, that we start to make some, some societal and systemic changes to the way we live, so that we are not putting our brains in these toxic environments. Mm-hmm. You know, I was mentioning things before about social media and lack of sleep and, and um, you know, lack of feeling of community, lack of exercise. Our society is going in a direction that's not good for our, for our mental health and our well-being. And I would hope that by 15 years from now, we'd have figured that out and we've dialed it back a bit and, and that we've actually equipped our younger generation to be able to be more um, mindful of their mental health and more to give them the tools to not deteriorate. I mean, you can do, we can do that now. You, yeah. you, they can start now. You're big, you know, you're big advocate for for education and and awareness to to protect your mental health, so it doesn't yeah. become uh, mental illness, basically, right? So. Uh, you know, concretely, what what would it look like? Yeah. So for me, and and any time I get the I get the <laughs> mic to say this, I will. So thank you for giving me the mic for this again. Um, I think that we not not I think I know that we need mental health education in schools, and it needs to start in kindergarten, and it needs to go all the way to the end of high school. And obviously, what we teach in kindergarten and the end of high school will be different, but we need to start by teaching social emotional awareness so how am i feeling am i happy sad angry or scared um and why am i feeling that way what can i do to you know if i'm if i'm over emotional what can i do to tone it down or if i'm under activated what can i do to bring my energy level up to meet the situation that i'm in um and then once I'm able to self-regulate then I'm also able to ask for what I need and what I want and I'm able to then learn to negotiate my relationships better. So we start with self-regulation, then we go to um, relationship negotiation kind of stuff, uh, and and we can you know move on to um, bigger things like identity, what and what my values are, and and how I can live a life where I 
have meaningful parts of my life and I have enough awareness of what I need as, as a human and what my brain needs as an organ so that, um, so that I can maintain my mental health. Sort of going full circle, coming back to people turning up uh, at ERs in exactly. distress. Exactly. Like what, what would be the, the impact on that? So, so to me, this is, it's so crucial because, you know, we keep hearing there's this many more millions for mental health and this many more millions for, the reality is if we don't do something to equip our youth and our society to better manage our mental health, we can keep throwing more and more resources, although we're still very underfunded. I'll just <laughs> put that caveat <laughs> out there. But um, we're never going to catch up. And so mm -hmm. we're always going to have these stories of people who are waiting for days and days and days in the emergency room because there's no beds available upstairs mm -hmm. uh, or who have you know, called 80 places and can't find a psychologist that, that can help them. Um, so unless we start to equip our youth and their parents, right? Let's let's be honest. Uh, part of the reason the kids don't know this is because their parents don't know it either. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't e equip ourselves as a society to understand what our brains and our minds need in order to function well, then we're hitting a wall. Mm. And but you're you're also doing this already. You know, through these programs, through the the, the transitional day program, there's more of, a, of an educational component as well, right? There's there's a, a shift towards that as well, and you're you're hoping to have even to more of that catch people uh, or conditions, I should say, earlier too, right? Yeah, there there is that that concept that sort of permeating through psychiatry and through um, and through public health, really. Um, uh, two things I want to say. One is that uh, a lot of treatment for mental distress, I'm not going to say mental illness, but mental distress can be done by the person themselves if they know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, yes, part of the psychoeducation point. And the other point I wanted to say is that we also know, and this is derived from first episode psychosis programs, we also know that if you interview, if you intervene quickly, um, you know, the quicker you treat a psychosis, the easier it is to treat and the less sequelae you're going to have. And so if you can treat a first episode psychosis and go to rehabilitation and, and, and reconnecting someone with their meaningful relationships and, and functioning in life, you're going to get a better outcome then if you catch someone two, three, five years down the road and they've been psychotic for all this time and meanwhile they've destroyed all their relationships and they no longer have a job and oops, you know, they forgot to renew their welfare and so now they mm. don't even have a place to stay. So that sort of downward drift, we know that that happens in psychosis. 